thing. I can do both. I can code switch. <laughs> um, so before I begin, I'd like to say thank you so much to the Department of Africana Studies, as well as to the Arizona Council of Humanities for the opportunity to come and share and engage with you all this evening about something that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, a little bit old, a little bit new, um, but nonetheless, I'm very happy to be here. So thank you all so much for giving me a little bit of your time uh, as you listen to me ramble about two of my favorite things, uh, three of my favorite things. Uh, hip hop, Zorona Hurston, and Outcast. <laughs> um, so, what I want to start with is um, an imagining, if you will, uh, of, of Zorona Hurston's porch. But before I do that, um, I feel like I can't stand here uh, in good faith and principle without um, asking for a moment of, of remembrance for Valerie Boyd. Uh, Valerie Boyd recently passed uh, this weekend. Um, she was the uh, one of the original autobiographers for Zora Neale Hurston for the book Wrapped in Rainbows. Uh, so I'm hoping that she is somewhere with the ancestors wrapped in rainbows and seeing that her work is still going to uh, continue. Um, but where I want to start is I'm really fascinated that there are two things that are happening in, in pop culture right now. There is a resurged interest in Zora Neale Hurston. Um, rightfully so, because sort of Hurston. But also there is an interesting turn to the South in pop culture, uh, whether it's hip hop, television, film. Um, there is a renaissance, if you will, of focus on the Black American South. The thing is, though, is that even though there is increasing representation of Southern blackness on a national scale, even an international scale, if you consider trap, which we can talk about later. Um, it's interesting to me that there is not enough context to think about why this shift is starting to occur. Um, a big part of my work is uh, showing and proving to people that there is such thing as a contemporary Black South. Um, all of us are not thinking about plantations and slaves and everything like that. Um, or Jim Crow, you know what I'm saying? Um, we realize that Jim is no longer Jim Crow, it's James. Um, it's not the same thing, but yet and still, there is very little language in place to articulate what a contemporary Southern Black experience looks like for folks. And as somebody who is a contemporary Southern Black person, that just puts me in my feelings um, because it makes it seem like there's no room for me or my voice or my truths because people are more comfortable with the past. Um, and I feel like that's something that puts me in conversation with somebody like Zora Neale Hurston because she was dealing with the same hateration back in the early 20th century. Um, in the moment where you have the Harlem Renaissance and folks are, are like Elaine Locke and W.B. Du Bois are like, no, we need to go to these urban spaces to be sophisticated. Um, Zorna Hurston was like, <laughs> pause. Um, what about the South? No, the South is this traumatic place. Uh, black people don't want to stay in the South. The South is a place that you have to escape if you're black. Says who? <laughs> Says what? One of the big questions that I often ask myself is, when we think about the great migration of the early 20th century, we often think about, you know, something like Isabel Wilkerson, where she says that the warmth of other suns, right? Like you go from the South and then you go somewhere to the Midwest, like Chicago, or you go to Los Angeles, or you go to, you know, New York, which I'm not a hater, but I'm a hater, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for understanding what I'm trying to say without saying it. But we never have conversations about what about folks who went from one part of the South to the other? They went from somewhere like Leary, Georgia, where my grandmother is from, to Atlanta, Georgia, or Houston, Texas, or New Orleans, or Miami, or Fort Lauderdale. We never have the conversations and stories about the folks who just went from one part of the South to the next. It's always depicted as this place that you need to escape from, right? Um, we never can seem to have, you know, a good day nationally either. It's either the South is the reason that the, the U.S. has gone to shit or the South is the reason that we saved it. In November, it was like, oh, it's the South. I'm from Georgia, so, you know, we were all in people business, right? Right along next to Arizona. Uh, everybody's in our business trying to tell us what to do, how to do it, right? Um, 
We didn't go blue, we went purple. I think that's going back to my primary school color days. Um, but then as soon as that didn't work out, well, it's the South's fault that politically we can't talk about these things. We can't talk about things like, you know, the, the new cuss word of 2021, 22, which is critical race theory without even thinking about it. If you didn't go to law school, technically you're not learning critical race theory. It's, it's a legal theorization about how the law is impacted by race. It has nothing to do with how race impacts the United States on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but yet still people are scared to have that conversation. Um, and the reason that they're scared to have that conversation is because it is so much easier to just say, it's the South's fault. Whenever something goes wrong, who's the first person on speed dial? Y'all still know what that is? Okay. It's the South. Um, and one of the things that I continuously think about this resurgence of interest in Zora Neale Hurston is that a lot of the questions that Hurston was addressing or thinking about in her writing and her research in her own, you know, thinking about herself are like the, along the same lines as the exact same questions that we're asking ourselves today in 2022. So you have, you know, an, an initial resurgence with Alice Walker from her 1975 article for Ms. Magazine that was in search of Zora Neale Hurston, where she talks about trying to find um, Zora Neale Hurston's gravesite and then putting a, a monument there to remember it. And that was in 1975. Um, but then in these last couple of years, we've revisited her publications. So most recently, she had her book of, of collected uh, nonfiction essays, You Don't Know Us Negroes, that was released last month or earlier this month. Um, you know, you have her collection of short stories, hitting a straight lick or hitting a straight lick with a crooked stick, which sounds like a trap mixtape that came out in 2020. Um, you have Barracoon, she talks to, uh, you know, arguably the last descendant um, from the slave ship in Alabama that came out. Uh, you also have interest from scholars like Lindsay Stewart, who last year came out with the book Politics of Black Joy, which situates Zora Neale Hurston as the cornerstone for thinking through what joy means to Southern black people throughout the ages. Um, and then you have me. Um, I feel like I'm just kind of joining this conversation a little bit. Um, and the reason that I'm joining this conversation is because I've always felt a connection to Zora Neale Hurston. Um, for multiple reasons. One, because she's always created her own path. And as a scholar that studies contemporary Southern Black culture and life experiences, I have been a scholar that has carved my own path. Um, I've been told multiple times that, um, well, you should focus on this. And especially, you know, when you get dubbed a quote unquote hip hop scholar, no, you need to focus on New York. Well, okay, there's a problem. I'm not from New York. The Albany that I'm from is in Southwest Georgia, not the capital of New York. Um, you know, Subway is a sandwich in Albany. It's not a mode of transportation. And we close on Sunday, like, <laughs> we, we close on Sunday. Um, so there's, there's that aspect of it. Um, but when I was writing chronicling Stankonia, there was something that was continuously coming to the front of my mind, which was I wanted to make sure that the type of scholarship that I wrote was accessible both inside the classroom and outside the classroom. Um, and I don't know if I'm supposed to share this, but I'm going to share it. So I, um, I did the audio book for chronicling Stankonia. It's not out yet. They're still editing my mess. But one of the things I was thinking about as I was reading it, and, and I know the other scholars in the room will feel my pain with this, is that when you have to read your own work out loud, it is the 10th circle of hell because you want to change everything. <laughs> I don't like this, I don't like that. But it was also a challenge because usually when you think about audiobooks, you think about like novels and short stories, it's a whole different ball game trying to you know, narrate uh, an academic book. Um, cause I embarrass myself. I'm like these long sentences, these, <laughs> all of these GRE study words. I don't, I hope somebody at least gives me a chance, but, um, it was, it was interesting like that. So when I'm thinking about this new project that I'm working on, which is a collection of personal memoirs and I guess critical autoethnography, if I want to borrow from the Academy a little bit, um, I was like, I think I want to, well, how do I, how do I, 
think about being in conversation with Zora Neale Hurston. Um, we know her for her novels, but we also know that her voice was such an accessible yet critical viewpoint and mirror that I was like, I want to be able to do that. Um, so you have pictures of Zora Neale Hurston. This is probably one of her more iconic pictures. Um, I'm surprised that Queen Latifah hasn't played her in a biopic yet. Um, Cause then I could, you know, I could be the stand-in. It's my second dream. Uh, <laughs> um, but the but the pictures that I want to pay attention to is this one on the right. Um, when I was doing initial research for this, uh, I just was kind of curious to see if there were pictures of Zora Hurston on a porch. Um, and this is one of the ones I found thanks to the University of Florida. So this is a young Hurston, and I'm assuming this is some of her people in them um, on her porch. And all of these questions started coming to my mind. What are y'all talking about? What are y'all drinking on? Well, spades play because, you know, dude look like he don't want to take the picture. So usually when people don't want to talk to you, it's because, you know, it was a, it was a card game gone wrong. Um, and it's just, and just the sly look on her face is like, if only y'all knew what we were really talking about, right? Uh, so I, I was like, I want to be on the porch. I want, I want us to have conversations. Um, I want to be able to pull her from the early 20th century into the 21st century without losing sight of who she is. But also it's like, if I was trying to converse with her about contemporary Southern blackness, what would our conversations look like? And that's what the focus of this new book project, um, if my institution remembers that I'm on sabbatical, would be about. <laughs> <laughs> So what I want to do is actually um, read a little bit from the project. Um, it's super rough, but you know I'm like Erica Badu. I'm I'm artist. I'm sensitive. So even if you don't like it, just smile, nod your head. Okay. Um, so this is for actually from uh, the introduction, which is called a little porch talk, um, and I'm going to read that for you all, and then jump into the rest of the presentation. Um, I learned at an early age about the porch as a gathering space. The porch was for gossiping, snapping beans, grilling, reclaiming space, cracking jokes, or sitting quietly enough to catch my breath while the world whirled by unamused and unconcerned about the everyday violence and triumphs of black people. The porch was a portal. You know black folks time travel on a daily basis. The porch was a physical space of gathering ancestors and memories. And for my Nanabu and Papa, the porch was the origin of their love story. For me, it was the origin of my love for my family and my grandparents, a congregating space of good news, bad news, and reckoning, even if it was just with loss. And you know something, Ms. Zora, I really wanna know if your porch evolved with you as you grew into yourself. Did you do your best shit talking on the porch? Like, before you typed your fury on a typewriter to tell Richard Wright about himself? Did you cuss him out on the porch and the trees swayed in agreement like a hallelujah chorus? Miss Zora, you are the patron saint of country black girls like me. I'm meeting you on the porch because we're still out here trying to find peace and trying to speak our peace for ourselves. I wanted to meet you here and get your blessing on the porch because the porch doesn't hold lies or liars. So, some think about, some think about. Oh, y'all so, thank you. <laughs> So I, as I as I work through, you know, what my porch conversations with Miss Zora look like, well, you got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> For me, I I wanted to have this conversation about, you know, Zora Hurston talked about jazz and blues, right? And then, you know, how it feels to be colored means she talks about like the globs of emotions or reds and blues and purples, and I was like, what? color would the knock of a trunk look like? Would bass look like? From the back of a ratty old Caprice or big body car, you know what I'm saying? Um, what would that be like? So 
when I when I thought about chronicling Stankonia, I had to recognize that I was talking about this thing that's called, you know, the hip hop South. And the hip hop South does its own thing. The interesting thing about the hip hop South is that now there are multiple hip hop Souths. I was in like, I don't know, the first generation of Southern hip hop, I feel like. Um, to the point where my daughter is tired of me. She don't, she don't, she don't care. Um, <laughs> she really doesn't. Um, Cause you know, for example, we were watching the, what was the NBA draft a couple years ago. And one of the questions that they asked was, you know, do you know who Outkast is? And my mentions and everything just went to shambles. Did you see they don't know who Outkast is? And then the last one that I got was from my daughter. She was like, mom, don't text me. I know who Outcast is. <laughs> and I was like, little girl, if you didn't, we need to have a whole different conversation about folks calling me an Outcast scholar. And my and my child does not know or appreciate Outcast. Uh, but there are multiple Southern hip hop experiences, multiple Southern hip hop narratives, and we're all in conversation with each other across time, space, and base. You know what I'm saying? Um, so this was me my freshman year of high school when I was still cute and thought metabolism was a forever thing. <laughs> uh, you never know what you got till you get older, right? Um, but it was important because, you know, I'm going to share a little bit from the introduction of Chronicle and Stankoni about why this is such a big thing. Is, you know, when I first moved to Albany, everything was just slower. I lived in the DMV. I lived right outside of, uh, I lived in Fort Belvoir, right outside of Alexandria. Um, well, of course there'd be DMV people here who know what I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, besides go-go, it was whatever was playing in New York, it was playing on 93.9 or 95.5. Um, so when I got to Albany, None of the stuff I was listening to as quote unquote hip hop even existed. They were like, what, what is this? <laughs> what are you, what are you listening to? We don't listen to none of that here. Um, so as somebody who's about to start high school, the challenge became trying to catch up with what hip hop was and what hip hop culture did. Um, so I'm going to read the part of the introduction where I embarrass myself and then we can, we can go on from there. Um... So when I moved, I was at Southside Middle School and people did not let me forget that I was the new girl. On top of that, my grandfather was the assistant principal at Southside Middle School for like 30 years. So that was fun. Um, and I was like, okay, it was never just Regina. It was always Mr. and Mrs. Barnett's granddaughter. I never could be called by my own, my own name. Uh, my schoolmates, laughed at my accent and fast enunciation and laughed harder when, well, when I tried to dance, um, which was equally jerky and <laughs> quick with my body. Um, and while, you know, my classmates chuckled and danced the right way, which I, I can't do it no more. My knees have been retired for years now. Um, one of my girlfriends pulled me aside and told me matter of factly, Child, you just wound up. You talk too fast. You dance too fast. You listen too fast. You just too wound up. And I learned quickly that I had to, to slow it down. Shorty was shouty. Girl was guh. Back was bike, which I feel like is an Albany original. And in addition to being my folks' granddaughter, I was described as the tall, smart, high yellow girl. And later, Gina May. And Gina May happened by accident, which was starting as a joke, to tone down my northeasternness and officially dub me a Southern girl. And they always would say, we're going to get you right, Gina May," and often with a wink and a drawn out laugh. And their intention wasn't mean or ill-spirited, which I had accepted as the norm in my previous middle school. And I grew to love my nickname and eventually let my guard down. So my access point to thinking about the post-civil rights South, which is ridiculously academic, right? It's not like Southerners go around and say, you know, I live in the post-civil rights 
American South. That's not what people say. They say that I'm from the South. And usually it's with an F and not a TH. <laughs> there is a distinction. Um, and we listen to particular, we listen a particular way, right? Like in the, in the South, we're not pedestrian. We, you know, everything's kind of sprawled out a little bit. The further that you leave the cities, the more you get into the country or the small town area, you can't just walk where you want to walk. Sometimes you got to cuss out your phone to make sure you keep the bars. You know what I'm saying? Um, but in places like New York, you listen through a Walkman or a Discman, right? Everybody streams now, but once upon a time, there was this thing called a Walkman. And that's how you got your music. That's not how it went in the South. In the South was, let me listen to it in the car. It was the car test. Southerners, if it hits me in my chest and makes me want to dance, I will give it a serious listen. New Yorkers, because they have, you know, they're, they're purists. Um, if it's not lyrically talking about anything that I don't even want to listen, son. And I'm like, okay. So even the way that we acknowledge what is and what is not hip hop is influenced by region, right? But when we have conversations about hip hop studies and hip hop scholarship, where does most of the hip hop scholarship come from? New York. Even Black Noise with Trisha Rose, which is canon, which is the reason that we have hip hop studies in the first place, focused on New York. A lot of the scholars we think about, right? The Mark Anthony Nils, the Michael Eric Dysons, where are they from? New York. <laughs> There's very few people in place at the time when I was studying that studied Southern hip hop. It was the question, right? Um, there are the folks who are like, well, why can't we just use that scholarship to talk about the South? Well, there's no familiarity with the South. So you can use that to apply to something that is illegible. It's at least illegible for you. <laughs> um, so that was one of the big reasons that I was like, I need to really focus on this conversation about what it means to be hip hop and Southern, especially in the academy, right? So I... You know, I can tell you the story, but I feel like they can tell you the story better. So I want to play this quick clip from the ATL documentary that came out a couple years ago um, about arguably the most important saying ever, you know, ever uttered in Southern hip hop culture. The year was 1995 and we were at the Source Awards in New York City. It was an interesting time that was going on within the music industry. This is like the height of the East Coast, West Coast, death row, bad boy, however you want to label it, beef. Any artists out there want to be an artist, don't want to worry about the producer trying to be all in the video, dancing, Woo! come to death row. It was a weird vibe going on that night because Suge was there, Snoop was there, and of course Biggie, the whole bad boy crew, and they were 10 bad boy, bad boy. Y'all don't love us! Well, let it be known then. We, we know y'all East Coast. We know we at. We're all just kind of tuned in trying to see if the fight going to break out. It was me and Big Boy and Dre. There's the three of us sitting there. So then they get ready to announce the award for best new artist. All right, all right, all right, all right, hold up. And the winner is. And guess who wins? Outcast. Outcast. And the house. When they said Outcast, you said, hmm. How are you going to get booed and you just won best new artist? It was backlash from the East Coast, West Coast thing. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty brutal to just be in a room full of people that's, that don't even really, really care about what you do. So what's up, Dre? Pressure can either bust pipes or create a diamond. And what Andre said when he got on that microphone created a diamond. But it's like this, though. I'm tired of folks, you know what I'm saying? 
the closed minded folks, you know what I'm saying? It's like we got a demo tape and don't nobody want to hear it, but it's like this the South got something to say. That's all I got to say. Everybody was like this on their seats, like, damn. From there, it was a wrap. For me, it might as well have been the national anthem. The South got something to say. To see Andre, Big Boy, dudes who were from right here, our area, man, South Side, East Point, and get up there, man, and say the South, South got, got something, something to say. say. Man, it turned to, it turned to everybody up. I mean, yeah, it did. <laughs> Uh, I feel like, I don't know, this is kind of like funny at the same time that we just saw the Super Bowl halftime show and we see like a seasoned Snoop. Um, and some folks feel like he's lost, quote unquote, lost his venom a little bit, right? Because he's gotten a little older and, you know, he's over here doing cooking shows with Martha Stewart and and all of these things. But it, I mean, like at one point in time, like Snoop was scary, right? Like it was like, he was like nothing to, to play with. He had murder charges. He wasn't playing. Uh, there's a reason he was on death row and then now he own it. Um, <laughs> so, but one of the things that's always fascinating about this particular clip is, well, there's the, there's a lot of reasons, but the two reasons that come out for me is the body language. When they're on the stage, there's a recognition that they are not accepted, that they are not welcome, but yet still it was like, okay. And then there's a particular Southern sensibility with Big Boy, who is arguably like the biggest instigator in hip hop on the low. Because he looks at her and he's like, so what's up? It wasn't like a, oh, share your thoughts about winning this award. So what's up means something totally different. And then you get Andre who is frustrated. You can hear it because he stutters a little bit at the beginning. He has this look on his face like, I'm sick of y'all. Um, and then he just says, you know, he speaks his piece, right? Um, and just that on top of the booing that happened, which always makes me laugh because now people want to be like, oh no, outcast. Everybody claims outcast. And I'm like, no, once upon a time, that wasn't the case. No, they're just real hip hop. No, they're real Southern hip hop, right? Um, and if you, you know, some folks are like, oh, you trying to be a revisionist. And I'm like, how am I a revisionist? And then y'all booed this man off stage. It's literally on tape, right? So it's really interesting to me now looking at this almost 30 years later that we are still having these conversations. I mean, like today it's no big thing that Southern hip hop is out there. Everybody trying to be Southern, right? To borrow from my hometown, a field mob, everybody want to be country now, right? Uh, you got folks from New York trying to sound like they from Atlanta, Okay, one of my favorite stories ever is, you know, when I first heard Designer and Panda, I was like, yo, what's Future doing? And my little brother was like, ma'am, <laughs> that is not Future. This is a dude named Designer. I'm like, okay, so I did my little Google, you know, and I'm like, he's from Brooklyn, but he sounded like Future though. What's up with that? Right? So it's just really interesting how now it's kind of like we can gloss over the regional thing, especially now that we're, you know, in these digital streets, I'm going to take that from you in these digital streets, because it's like, if you have access to the internet, you can just be like, you know, yeah, I'm from, you know, East country point, Montana. But today I feel like sounding like I'm from Miami or you can be from Canada, Drake. And decide that, you know, today you want to sound like you from Memphis. Then you want to sound like you from Louisiana. Is he still in Louisiana? Is it still in Louisiana? He done moved over now. He moved. Like on the, on the podcast, I said Drake is the most well-known carpetbagger in hip hop. Like it's, he jumped, man. He jumped. <laughs> Don't laugh at me because I'm telling the truth. Because because it's like, it's just, you know. But all of that to say is that there is interesting to me, and this is not my ministry, this is not my line of scholarship, this is why I'm trying to make room for the up and coming scholars behind me to have this conversation, because I can't, which is the significance of social media and what kind of access that has to what we think is and is not Southern hip hop or Southern hip hop culture. That is just, I never can answer that question and I intentionally don't answer that question because that's not my era. Um, my era stopped in 2008 when I started my PhD program and had no life. Right. So I couldn't focus <laughs> like I like I could earlier. Where I could be like, I could just listen to this music all day, every day. No, Ph.D. in English was like, no, you're going to read this two thousand twenty five hundred pages a week. 
and listen to your little playlist from back when you thought you had a life, right? So it's not just the hip hop South got something to say. They still got something to say. We're trying to figure out now what that is. Um, but I just want to go through this one last little piece and then we can have our conversation. Um, so, you know, what does it mean to be a black girl from the hip hop South? So this is my Nana boo. It's my world right there. That's my, that's my world. It's my Nana. Um, this is where my South starts. It's with my grandparents, right? And their stories about what it meant to grow up in the Jim Crow South. Um, my grandparents were among the first black educators to integrate the Doherty County school system. So that idea of witnessing has forever been part of my experience, right? What that type of education um, means. Um, and then those are three of my best friends. Those are my, my line sisters. They don't call it line sisters no more. It's co-initiates. Uh, <laughs> um, that, you know, this was us hanging. I remember this picture because this was taken at like 5.30 in the morning and we had just got back from the club and it was great. And then, you know, I graduated from Albany State University uh, in Albany, Georgia, which is an HBCU, a public HBCU. Um, everybody in my family, with the exception of my brother, graduated from Albany State. So I was third generation. My little brother went to Savannah State because that's where his daddy went. So whatever. So we only we only talk most of the year except during football season. Then I have to disown him. So there's that. But it's like, what does it mean to be a black girl from the hip hop South? What does it mean for Southern hip hop to influence how I understand what girlhood is, what womanhood is? Um, because it's different than what my grandmother told me that womanhood is. Because it, it gets to the age old debate of being ladylike. And being ladylike is something totally different. Being ladylike means, you know, you don't wear pants to presentations like this. You don't wear the color red, cause that's, that's a fast grown color. You wear girdles. <laughs> you know, you go to church on Sunday. The number one rule of my house was, if I went out Saturday night, it didn't matter. You going to church and not just like regular church service. No, 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 no. Sunday school. What time does Sunday school start? Eight o'clock. So if even if I come in late from homecoming dance or whatever, they were like, nope, nope. My grandmother would literally have my clothes laid out when I got into the house. Like, there you go. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> so there were different, there were different touchstones for what respectable womanhood meant, right? And the conservatism that is associated with sexual agency and Southern black women has not changed since my grandmother was coming of age. Now we're in a moment where we got folks like Megan Thee Stallion, you know what I'm saying? You got city girls, you got these, and they're all, you know, who are, you know, is it just big lotto now? She changed it, it ain't me, it's just big lotto now. Who are, expressing themselves sexually in their lyrics and folks want to clutch pearls, right? So to speak. And the reason they want to clutch pearls is because they're like, no, you don't, that's so unladylike, right? Academically, we think about that as politics of respectability. So Evelyn Brooks Higginbottom offers that term to talk about church women, black church women, right? But it has taken on a life of its own to mean you know, these are the things that you have to do in order to be seen as humane, as order to be seen not necessarily as, as close to whiteness as possible because whiteness is still the standard for humanity, unfortunately. Um, but it's still a thing. We don't go around saying, you know, my grandmother didn't say, you know, for you to have politics of respectability, you have to wear a girdle to church. She said, no, you don't cut your hair, you don't wear that because that's not ladylike, right? This idea of being a lady, something that is worthy of being saved, worthy of having these conversations. And going back to, you know, Zora Neale Hurston, this is something that she tackled in her novels all the time. All of her women characters were strong Southern black women. From Janie Crawford in Their Eyes Are Watching God, right? Who, interestingly enough, starts and finishes on a porch, <laughs> right? Um, she comes in at dusk, right? And in Southern lore, you know, if you do something at dusk, that is symbolic of death, OK? 
Okay. So it's like you're coming in, you're basically destroying all of these things that are in place. Her hair is out and down, which you don't have your hair just out and down if you're a respectable lady, right? She didn't care about any of those things. It doesn't matter. It's interesting to me that these conversations, again, are we're still having them now, even back when Zorna Hurston was writing about this in the 1930s and 1940s, right? So the last little theory I'm going to throw at y'all is, in my book, I talk about this idea of country black girl existentialism, right? And existentialism is basically the question of why we exist. That is a very watered down version. So if there are literary theory scholars in the audience, do not come for me. I don't have enough time to engage in what the full bodied existentialism is. But basically this is a question about how Southern black girls try to see each other across time and space, right? Um, the active pushback. So. You know, Meg, for example, Megan Thee Stallion is in conversation with blues women, with Ma Rainey's, right? These women who are using the blues to say things about pleasure. And this is what I want, what I don't want. She didn't just all of a sudden come out of a vacuum, which is what people want us to believe, right? Like Megan Thee Stallion just came out of nowhere. So all of a sudden there's this young black girl rapper from Houston that's talking about, you know, Sex, <laughs> right? And it's also this non-linear cross-generational conversation and being able to see each other in ways that society would rather us not see each other and have these conversations. But my favorite part about this is it's the disruption of ladylike being the only way to be considered respectable or respected, right? How do we push back against those conversations? And hip hop is the main vehicle through which this is happening. It's not happening in church, even though you have folks like Candace Marie Benbo, for example, with Red Lip Theology, which is bomb, um, who are pushing back against these conservative stories, right? But for the most part, it's not happening in the church. It's happening in pop culture, it's happening in conversations that girls are having in the hallways, in the bathrooms, in the lockers, right? The conversations that you have to, you have to whisper or back in my day, the ones that you passed in the notes, like don't let anybody see this, right? With the big eyes, like don't let nobody see it. So it's interesting to see how this expands. But, you know, going back to the Mighty Outcast. They give you probably one of those, the most best examples, which is from the art of storytelling, and Andre in particular telling his story about Sasha Lumper. Bad now, like bad now. Now Susie Screw had a partner named Sasha. Sasha. Thumper. Thumper. I remember her number like the summer when her and Susie yeah they threw a slumber party, but you can't call it that because it was slumber. Well, it was more like spending night, three in the morning, yawning, dancing under street lights. We chilling like a feeling and a new feeling right in the middle of the ghetto on the curb and the spite. All of the bush, we on our back staring at the stars above. Talking about what we gonna be when we grow up i say what you want to be she said alive it made me think for a minute then looked in the eyes i could have died time went on i got grown rhyme got strong mine got blown i came back home to find little sasha was gone her mama said she would have that be treating her wrong i kept on singing my song and hoping at a show that i would one day see her standing in the front row but two weeks later she got found in the back of a school with a needle in her arm baby too much to yeah so the interesting thing about this song is is it's one of the best outcast songs ever, but there's that. But it's always interesting because you have Big Boy who gives you the more sexually explicit version in her friend, Susie Screw, right? Um, and then you have Andre flip the script and actually give humanity to this girl. Was, I mean, like even like a, a particular type of childhood innocence, they're outside with the lights on and they're, and they're playing, you know, tag and all this stuff like that. And I mean, like, you have this heartbreaking question, and clearly he doesn't think it's a heartbreaking question at the time because they're kids, but he's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Which is something that we ask kids all the time, and I know kids are sick and tired of us asking what they want to be when they grow up. So you're like, <sighs> right? But she gives this answer of alive. Not a career. Not like I want to be a college graduate. And, you know, no, no pageant answers. She just wants to be seen. She wants to be visible. She wants to will herself into the future and unfortunately due to life circumstances that doesn't happen. So 
she's in conversation with other characters, right? Other people like Anna Julia Cooper, for example, which in A Voice from the South, she talks about how Southern black women and girls are the shivering fatal class of the South, right? Um, she's also in conversation with folks like Shalea Crump from Kiese Lehman's novel, Long Division, where she asks a similar question and she often says dot, 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 which is an ellipsis. And what does an ellipsis do, right? Make your comp people proud, which is it holds space. It's a break in thought. It's like a, an infinite loop, if you will. So it's really interesting to think about how those are in conversation with a standardized acceptance of the South that is cyclical. The South doesn't have anything happen in it that's linear. 1861 to 1865, you got the Civil War, and then that's it. No, 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 not Southerners. <laughs> it ended in 1865, but every year we're going to have reenactments. This is going to be the year that history changes, <laughs> right? Um, you also have this understanding, you know, you have folks who have plantation tourism. They go, to they go on tours of the plantations and of course plantations are gorgeous, right? They're supposed to be gorgeous, but the question that folks don't wanna ask is, well, what makes them so gorgeous? Who did the work? And unfortunately you still have some plantations who tell you that they had enslaved black folks who were happy where they were. And I'm just like, that's not how none of this works. Um, I just really want to do it one good time. Like, that's not how none of this works. And just disrupt the whole tour. It's on my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> but there is this expectation that, oh, this is what's going to happen. So when I say that the South is, is cyclical, we talk about the civil rights movement all the time, right? We're in a moment now where people use Dr. King to shut down conversations that he would want to have. Right. You got the folks who are like, oh, well, Dr. King had a dream. And I'm like, Dr. King also said, <laughs> right. But we don't want to have those conversations. We try to pick and choose which part of history make us comfortable, which part, which parts make us not have to critically engage. Right. So it's interesting in thinking about the continued significance and evolution of Southern hip hop culture and how that is bridging that yearning for the past with how it is starting to unfurl in the present and the future, right? So if there's nothing else that, you know, y'all get from me, the question is, what do we expect of the South? Why is it such a traumatizing space to even critically engage what that social landscape looks like. You can't pick and choose what parts make you comfortable. You need to take it for its totality. And that's what Southern hip hop does. It takes the good, the bad, the ugly, right? And brings that to the forefront so that we can have honest conversations about what the Black South means today. That's it. Thank y'all. fascinating discussion of so much regarding hip hop in the past as well as the present changes in the black south if you have questions uh, please once again use the QR code on your seat and as they uh, populate we'll just fill those questions but one of the things to start off with is thinking kind of about the trajectory of chronicling Stanconia um, and what you are accomplishing now with thinking about Zora Neale Hurston. So you take up Zora Neale Hurston's 
work a bit. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what what was the impetus for having a larger conversation uh, past your last work? Uh, people came for me. Uh, the first question was, why didn't you talk more about women? And I was like, well, because if I talk more about women, there'd be no chronic and stank odia for y'all to be upset about. Um, but it, I felt like it was an organic transition. I wanted to talk more about Southern black women and who else but to think about Zora Hurston when talking about Southern black women. Um, even folks like Alice Walker, who was her inspiration, Zora Neale Hurston. So I was like, okay. And then when I really started thinking about what she was doing in terms of of documenting the culture and inserting herself into the culture, that was something that I wanted to do with my own work, right? Um, especially because, you know, as an academic, um, we're trained to not include ourselves in our research. But this book wouldn't have happened if I didn't insert myself in the conversation, if I didn't ask those questions about, you know, region and agency, um, and, and asked a real simple question. The question that I started this whole journey on was, well, why am I not reading any scholarship about the artist that I'm listening to in my car at the moment? And nobody could give me a, a decent answer. Um, you know, I had the, from on one end, which was, there's nothing about Southern hip hop that is deserving to be studied to, well, well, I just don't have the tools you know, or the knowledge to engage it. Um, so is that there was that aspect of it. I don't want to call it creating new knowledge because I feel like that's what Hurston does is she creates new knowledge. But I do hope that I'm creating new pathways to get to the community knowledge that's already in place. Um, and I feel like that's what I'm currently doing is excavating these conversations, these critical contexts that have been overlooked in traditional study. Um, but it's also what keeps me connected to the academy. I can't, I can't do anything else. <laughs> Nine to five is not my ministry. <laughs> well, if you could tell us a little bit about your approach to uh, critical autoethnography as you uh, talk about uh, thinking about uh, some of the works of Zora Neale Hurston, she shows up um, intentionally so in her text and in similar ways, uh, you use that as an approach in your work. Um, is that about the commitments that you keep uh, to communities? Is that a tool that you're using for your scholarship? That's a great question. I feel like I'm still trying to feel out what my standpoint is on critical autoethnography. Um, and the reason, you know, and I'm thinking about Beverly Guy Shevdal, um, who really calls for that in her, in her approach to black feminism, right? It's like, how are you going to talk about black women and not center black women? Um, you know, kind of like the whole conversation or the, you know, on, on social media now about if a certain rapper was with black, a black woman, it would all work out. And I'm like, black women aren't work mules. We're not. We're not these folks that you, we're not magical Negroes, you know, what I'm saying? it's not like you come and like, oh, I have this problem, which unfortunately has happened to me a couple of times. It's like, I need you to help me work through that. And I'm like, that is not my job and you are not paying me. Um, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, black women are magic, right? Um, not to say, you know, there's a black girl magic thing. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that black women and girls are real people and, we continuously have to fight to be seen as real people. Um, and I feel like that's something that I take from Zora Neale Hurston, that I take from Alice Walker. When I was flying out here today, I don't know why, but something in my spirit told me to watch The Color Purple. And I watched The Color Purple and I went through all the motions. I was like, Danny Glover still ain't shit. <laughs> I was like... Miss Millie need to go sat down somewhere. Uh, when she gets, you know, if you haven't seen The Color Purple by now, this is a spoiler alert, but when she gets reunited, <laughs> you about like 30 years late, but it's like, you, you, she gets reunited, you know, Celie gets reunited with her kids. Like I was like boo hoo crying on the plane. I was just like, and the guy sitting next to me was like trying to like not. <laughs> <laughs> but I was watching it and I was just like, 
I, I, I didn't watch it because I've watched it 50, 11 times and it's always on BET every other weekend, you know. But I was like, I was listening to it. I was listening to the sounds of the South in that movie. Like the cicadas and the crickets and the, and the silence and the thunderstorms and like the sayings, um, you know, you know, how you and, and all of, I'm just like all of these things that I grew up with. And I'm like, yes, this, this is it. Right. Um, it, it's an opportunity for me to not lose sight of who I am as a Southern black woman who grew up in Southwest Georgia. Right. I didn't grow up in Atlanta. I don't claim to be from Atlanta. It's hilarious now, but I would really be ready to fight when I'd be like, I'm from Georgia. And the next thing out of people's mouth is, oh, what part of Atlanta are you from? I didn't say anything about Atlanta. And then they're like, oh, my bad. Where are you from? And I'm like, proud. I'm like, I'm from Albany, Georgia. And then the next question is, well, how far is that from Atlanta? <laughs> so I think it's an opportunity to show people how expansive the South really is. Like it's bigger than Atlanta. It's bigger than Miami. It's bigger than Houston. It's bigger than Memphis, New Orleans. Um, and being able to contribute to that body of work by Southern Black women writers and scholars and thinkers um, proves that we are continuously evolving and continuously um, adding to the story, right? I think that's one of the things that I most appreciate about Zora Neale Hurston's work is that there was always room to add to the story. It wasn't just like, you know, these six gilded bits and that's it. It was always like, you can have, continue to have these conversations. There are multiple generations of Janie Mae Crawfords. There are multiple generations of Suge Avery's. There are multiple generations of Seeley's, right? Of these women. You, you know what I'm saying? You wouldn't have a Jasmine Ward and, and Salvage the Bones or Sing on Berry Sing and these difficult Southern Black women that Ward refuses to step away from without Zora Neale Hurston, without Alice Walker, right? Which is why it just like really pisses me off when people have conversations about, you know, Jasmine, right? And they use William Faulkner to do it. And I'll be like, no, no, why? Of course, she's going to be influenced by Faulkner. A lot of folks are influenced by Faulkner. But you know what? Faulkner couldn't give you a cussing ass Southern black woman who was complicated. Southern black folks are always in the background of Faulkner stories. And I will go to war with any literature made in literature scholar who says otherwise. You show me a dynamic black character that Faulkner has wrote. I'll wait. Dynamic. I'm not talking about like one or two lines or they show up in the kitchen or they show up and do. No, 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 no. I'm talking about complicated, has an interior life. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. That, that's interesting. It makes me, it, it's interesting that you mentioned um, Alice Walker's Color Purple um, and there was, so much criticism right. that Steven Spielberg produces it. What does it mean to tell our stories uh, in the presence of whites? Um, and, and and I'm curious what that means for what you seek to do with this work. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing about what I'm about to say. I have gotten to the point in my career. I am tenured. I earned it. So you can speak openly. I don't give a damn. <laughs> I have real talk. I don't, I don't care what white folks think about what I got to say. I just don't because folks before me have paid the way they've paid for me not to shy away from my truth, not to shy away from my voice. And then the fun part is when folks want to assume that you can't speak like them, that you can't have, you know, you can't use big academic words like homogeneity and discourse <laughs> that you don't belong. I have long accepted and understood that the academy was not meant for black women. 
I also have long understood that the black women who have contributed to the academy have all died early. A lot of our giants have died early. Bell Hooks died in, in December. You know what I'm saying? Cheryl Wall died the year before that. Valerie Boyd passed this past weekend. It's, it's one of those things where you just have to hold tight to why you do the work. And I do the work because I refuse to let others who are not familiar with my experiences dictate and tell me what it means to be Southern. Dictate and tell me what it means to be Southern and Black. Tell me what Southern hip hop is. And the last thing they listened to was Soldier Boy. Don't talk to me. Don't talk to me about this is what it means. Right. And I feel like that is the one thing that I try to instill in my students is that nobody can tell your story like you can. There will be multiple people who will try to tell you, you need to talk about your story like this and you need to do this because you have to include or you have to make sure that your viewpoint is accessible and friendly. But guess what, y'all? Like a lot of the experiences that black folks deal with aren't friendly and accessible because if that was the case, we would not be in the place that we're in right now. You would not have folks saying all lives matter when somebody says that black lives matter. Nobody said that all lives didn't matter. But you don't, but though, if all lives mattered, you wouldn't be mad when we said that black folks matter. You wouldn't be using Dr. King to shut down a conversation about why black folks matter. Dr. King wouldn't be out here protesting in these streets. Yes. Yes, the hell he would. <laughs> he wouldn't disrupt anything. He wouldn't want us having these conversations. I think the scary thing though, especially because we're in the classroom in college, is I'm scared I'm going to get to the point where I have students who come to a class on African American literature who don't know anything about African American literature because of a phobia of black life. And that's where we're headed, unfortunately. I want to share a few of the questions sure. uh, from our online viewers. It says, could you share more about your thoughts on Sunday's halftime show? <laughs> Have you engaged at all with womanist writers? Okay. I think that's a yes. Mm -hmm. For example, the late K Katie Geneva Cannon wrote Ooh. about Zora Neale Hurston. I'm all reverend. From a womanist perspective. Mm -hmm. I... I'm still learning. That's the part I love, right? Like I can tell you where I still have to grow. Um, and most PhDs will tell you that. Most PhDs will tell you we know about a very finite piece of information. We could tell it to you back and forth, right? No offense to the master students, but they said it's the master's folks who feel like they know everything after their thesis. <laughs> and his dissertation and his PhDs were like, I don't know nothing. Um, I, I'm one of those folks. I feel like I don't know enough. Like, I feel like I've, I've read the foundational works, but I am always a student. I'm always learning. Um, so there's, there's that aspect of it. Um, in terms of the halftime show, <laughs> I had so many conflicting thoughts about the halftime show. On the one hand, I was like, ooh, there are so many mad people in this audience at the stadium because they don't know what's going on. Um, I saw that uh, Eminem took a knee after the NFL told him not to. And folks were like, that was such a brave, bold move. And I'm like, no, it wasn't really that bold or brave. I'm glad he did it. But it wasn't like this super courageous thing. There's that aspect of it. Uh, Mary was flawless. I was trying to figure out how to get those boots and what I could wear it with. Um, but I also... <laughs> <laughs> uh, 50 Cent shouldn't have been upside down for that long from in the club <laughs> uh, I don't think he's in the club like that um, I thought Kendrick's performance was flawless and I also think the subtlety of him performing all right was his stance that Black Lives Matter because that is the go-to song for so many protests is Kendrick Lamar um, I had mixed feelings about Dr. Dre. The reason I had mixed feelings about Dr. Dre is because, well, let's face it, he beats women. 
I thought about D Barnes the whole time. I was like, every time he was on there, it doesn't matter how brilliant, you know what I'm saying? You have to put that in tandem with this legacy that he was putting out. Um, and then I was thinking like, Snoop has become so, not necessarily lovable, but likable. Utterly. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it hasn't always been like that. And it makes me think about how pop culture has a short memory. <laughs> As a short memory, um, I wish they would have included Nipsey in that tribute. Um, the quick, you know, I ain't mad at your introduction to Tupac was, that was quick. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I thought it was, I thought it was interesting. I'm still trying to figure out how Mary J. Blige fit into that performance because it was so many LA folks, you know what I'm saying? Um, and then the other part of that is, well, if we're focusing on L.A., where are the L.A. women rappers like the Yo-Yos and the Lady of Rage and, you know, all of these folks. So, I I mean, I enjoyed it. Um, it took me back for like, what, 10 minutes. I was still laughing at 50 Cent. <laughs> um, but I mean, like, I thought it was I thought it was I mean, it was entertaining. It was, but at the same time, I'm like, I was also thinking about these other things. And that's why my husband don't like watching TV with me no more. <laughs> Here's another question. What do you think are the biggest similarities and differences between your generation, however you define that, <laughs> understanding of the importance of hip hop culture in newer generations? Yeah. I feel like Okay, so remember at, like at the beginning, I was saying like there's different different generations of Southern hip hop now. So you have like the golden era, which is like the late '80s to like about I want to say maybe like '98, because I feel like '98 is when Atlanta just for real for real exploded. Um, and then you have like '98 to like about '05, right? Um, I feel like that decade is my generation, if you will. Um, and the thing that I want to, you know, the, the one thing that I miss, and I feel like the old woman kind of sitting on her porch and shaking her fist a little bit, is that I miss the variety of sounds that you heard when I was back, back, back in my generation. Um, because I felt like it was, it was proof that Southern hip hop wasn't monolithic. It was like Atlanta had a particular sound, had multiple particular sounds. Memphis had a particular sound. Miami had a particular sound because we were pulling from different things. New Orleans was pulling from jazz. Memphis was pulling from blues. Miami was pulling from the Caribbean. You know what I'm saying? Atlanta was pulling from funk and gospel. Um, but now it's kind of like we are at a moment now where if one sound sells, everybody tries to sound like that one thing, right? Like I miss the experimentation, I think. And I think the biggest thing that I would want for younger folks, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, like my godson, he's, he's 15. And we have all of these conversations about music, but I'm always telling him, you need to listen to him before you listen to him. Because if you listen to her, they're all in conversation, right? Um, is that it hasn't, always been like this but yet like whenever we have these documentaries and conversations it's always like oh well hip-hop did this one kind of like homogenous thing and I'm like it's, it wasn't it wasn't like that like it's okay to represent where you're from I mean like the hyper locality of hip-hop culture is one of the things that initiated it from the jump it was like you know what I'm saying so I I want there to be more conversations about the roots of where this music is coming from. Now everybody listens to trap, right? And trap is international. You have, you know, uh, Christina went to go visit um, her mother-in-law and they were in Tibet and she sent me a clip. She's like, I can't stay for long, but I want you to listen to this real quick. And it was Tibetan monks doing trap music. I didn't understand what they were saying, but they were serious. <laughs> so trap is no longer in the South, but when it started, it was, right? Um, but now you have everything, trap karaoke, trap yoga, trap water. But I'm like, if you really understood where trap culture came from, you would see kind of like how dumb this really is. It's like if trap culture is talking about illicit drug culture and, and stuff like that, which is part of it, right? I want you to imagine you going to try to buy some drugs. And then he's like, 
Give me one second before I give you this Nick bag. I have to do downward facing dog to balance my chakras. Namaste. That's not how this work. <laughs> it's not how it's not how this work. But I mean, like it's been commodified to the point where we have lost the origins. And that's something that I am kind of terrified of is losing the origins of what makes the culture so dynamic. So that kind of takes us back to the authenticity debates. Um, yeah. what, do, what do you think about that in your uh, earlier book? You talk about. Uh, trap as the space where black masculinity is mm. worked out. Uh, what does that mean? Um, is it accessible in the regard that groups are working out those kind of gender uh, issues or or does it totally change it from those kind of roots? I feel like it's totally changed it from from then um, because I mean, like, yeah, I just feel like the trap at one point was a grieving space. Um and, and now for a lot of folks, it's just a party space. It's just something that you listen to when you go to the club. But the reality of it is, and this is the thing that I will forever love about Southern hip hop, is that we can do two things at once. We can make you dance, but we can also make you think. Um, I'm always like iffy about the word authenticity um, because I feel like it's exclusionary, right? Um, but, I also, but I also think that... Um, in terms of thinking about roots and genealogies. Like I feel like genealogies is stronger here. Um, I, I wish folks would know the genealogies of this music that you're listening to and, and speaking with, right? Um, engaging, and unfortunately, a lot of folks either don't have the width, the bandwidth, or just the outright refusal um, to think about these things. And unfortunately, you can hear that in the music today. I think we have time for maybe uh, one more question. Sure. Um, and I think this is a, a really good final question. Okay. Uh, favorite Goody Mob album? <gasps> and why? Oh, that's rude. <laughs> that's so rude. Okay. Uh, favorite Goody Mob album is Soul Food. It's the first one. <laughs> it's, it's Perfection. Um there's so many things that happen on that album. We get introduced to the concept of Dirty South. We get introduced to the concept of trap. You get a raw and unfiltered CeeLo that's still wrapped. Bring back rapping CeeLo Green. <laughs> um, my favorite Outkast album today is Equimini. Um, Yesterday it was AT Aliens, because that's what I was just listening to. But today I went back to Equimini, so. Uh, yeah, long live the Dungeon family, man. Just the just the body of work that they gave us in such a short amount of time um, is more than worthy of being studied and celebrated. Uh, and I just hope that I'm one of many to come. Wonderful. Thank you so much Thank you for, for your me. time. Thank you for your questions. Your they were so good. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us this evening and have a good evening. Y'all have you. a good one. Thank you for coming out.